I've always loved the look of IMAX. Um, for starters, I grew up about 10 minutes from the IMAX World Headquarters, and as a teenager once snuck in there before being promptly told to leave. Um, but to their credit, uh, I, they were polite. Um, one of my most vivid memories from my childhood uh, about going to see a movie is a IMAX laser pre-show that used to uh, play before a film at my local IMAX. Welcome to the famous players IMAX theater at the Coliseum. Something I later found out was unique to that location. I also went to and still go to the Cinesphere Theater in Toronto, which was the world's first permanent IMAX theater. Um, though even without all these personal connections to IMAX, I still think I'd be uh, just as deeply interested in the process just due to the experience of seeing a real IMAX movie shot with IMAX cameras on the massive 15 to 70 uh, IMAX large format film. Attempting to recreate the look of IMAX has been something that I've been working on for, uh, I don't know, casually for a few years, kind of a, a project that I drift in and out of during less busy periods. Um, and it mostly stems from the fact that I've always found a lot of shot for IMAX, in quotation marks, digital movies, don't really have that same IMAX feeling. Um, notice that I said shot for IMAX though, because pretty much every movie shot digitally um, that's shown then in an IMAX theater isn't actually shot with IMAX cameras. They're usually shot with high resolution, often large format digital cameras like the Ari Alexa um, LF um, or the Alexa 65, um, the Sony Venice or any similar large format digital cinema camera. Noticing that even these large sensor cameras weren't quite replicating the look of real IMAX film to me, um, I got curious as to what could be done to replicate that look digitally, and if it can even be done at all. Um, I want to say quickly that the only digital shot for IMAX film I've seen in theaters that to me has successfully captured the look of IMAX um, was Denis Villeneuve's Dune. Uh, which makes me think they utilized plenty of the principles that I'm going to discuss in this video. To start, we need to understand what actually causes the IMAX look in the first place. And while it, it is a product of IMAX film having the largest image plane of any motion picture format, including those large format digital cameras I mentioned earlier, um, it's actually not the size of the film gauge that's creating the look alone. Um, but rather the ratio of the aperture size to the subject or the opening in the lens that lets the light through. A pretty common question about large format lenses is if a f2.8 aperture on a super 35 lens is say, you know, 
this big. Um, but an f2.0 aperture on a large format lens is this big. Um, why is the larger format lens still only a 2.8, even though it's got a bigger opening? And it all has to do with how the light is spread out onto the film plane. Large format lenses have to spread the light out, light out wider um, to a wider beam to cover the larger image circle. Um, so therefore the opening of the lens, the aperture has to be larger in comparison to say a super 35 format lens. Now you can actually use a device called a speed booster um, to focus light from a large format lens onto a smaller sensor, which is why speed boosters make a lens brighter than it actually is rated um, by usually a single stop or so. You could say that they boost the speed of the lens. Um, you can think of this like how a Fresnel lens attachment on a light uh, lowers the brightness. The wider the beam gets, the more spread out the light is. If you want to see a cool video that goes into this effect in detail, um, I urge you to check out the two videos from Media, Media Division, um, which are linked in the description. So to recap, IMAX has a distinct shallow look because the aperture is larger in relation to the subject than with smaller format lenses. Notice I said in relation to the subject, not in relation to the sensor. Bear with me for a moment while I go through this. Um, so imagine you've got a small sensor, say the size of an iPhone or something like that. Um, and I don't mean the full iPhone, I mean an iPhone sensor. Um, and you bring your camera pretty close to, let's say, a Lego figure. The depth of field is going to get pretty shallow because at that distance, the ratio between the sensor size and the subject size is pretty high um, to the sensor that's viewing it. Now turn that Lego figure into a regular sized human, scale up the distance from the human to the camera by about an equal amount, and turn that small iPhone sensor into a massive frame of IMAX film um, with a large format lens, and you can see how as the image plane gets larger, necessitating a larger aperture to avoid vignetting the image, um, and that subject size also gets larger, then that subject size to aperture ratio stays pretty large to the viewing point on the sensor or physical film. However, the second and, um, in my opinion, most important element to the look of IMAX film is its tall 1.43 to 1 aspect ratio. A lot of people often confuse this to be the same as 4x3, um, or like the classic Academy ratio that movies used to be shot in, um, or 1.33 to 1 is its actual ratio. Um, but IMAX film is actually slightly wider than that. It's 1.43 to 1. So this is actually one of the things that really attracted me to the X-H2S um, here, the Fujifilm X-H2S, as a way of emulating the look of IMAX film. And because, uh, despite it having a Super 35 sensor, um, that's right, it's not even full frame, um, the taller 1.50 to 1 aspect ratio made it an ideal uh, candidate for me. So let me just explain in detail uh, why I believe that IMAX's look is more dependent on its aspect ratio than the actual size of the film or the resolution. And it all comes down to the way filmmakers compose shots. Uh, so generally when someone is composing a shot of, say, a person in a doorway, there's a certain position the person's head should be in um, in regards to standard framing principles. This is, of course, the upper third of the image, um, but of course this guideline is broken quite frequently. Uh, what that means, though, is that if we're framing for the same shot on IMAX and, uh, say, for a com comparably large uh, format motion picture film gauge, let's say we're using IMAX and VistaVision. Um, VistaVision is about the same size as a digital full-frame camera. Um, the way that that shot is composed will be fundamentally different because of the different aspect ratios. Um, another quick side note is that VistaVision could be shot in a taller 166 aspect ratio, an aspect ratio that got a lot of use in Europe, um, but it was most often projected at a standard 1.85 to 1 ratio, or what we consider spherical widescreen today. Because of this, when you're framing someone's head in the upper third of the image, you're naturally going to see less of the floor in front of the camera um, on a wider aspect ratio. Now, if we frame that same shot in a taller IMAX ratio using the same upper third principle, you can see that we're actually much closer to the floor of the camera, or we're seeing much more um, of the floor in front of the camera. 
And thus we're getting a much clearer view of that depth of field roll off as the floor nears the camera's position. Note that this of course occurs with any foreground elements, um, not just floors. Uh, see how even in this extreme long shot, you can still see the focus drop off slightly towards the camera. The houses in the foreground are slightly out of focus. And then if I crop this image to a standard aspect ratio, despite, despite still being shot on IMAX film in a crazy high resolution on a massive film size, it loses a lot of that big feeling um, just by changing the aspect ratio. So if we think back to that Lego man and iPhone analogy from before, a shallower depth of field makes a subject look smaller, thus making the image as a whole feel larger. Sounds a bit contradictory, but it makes sense when you think about it in terms of miniatures. So back when movies used to use primarily miniatures for visual effects, um, you know, much more frequently, uh, filmmakers had to throw a ton of light at the subject so that they could stop the lens down, um, deepening the depth of field. A deeper th depth of field makes an object look further away um, thus making it uh, appear that, say, a, a one-meter model is actually 100 meters long um, and much further from the camera. So you'd never want to shoot a miniature on IMAX because the massive aperture that's required to create an image circle that large is going to make anything look tiny uh, due to the shallow depth of field. They actually ran into this problem when they were shooting the miniature effects on Interstellar. Um, and to solve it, they shot the miniature effects on VistaVision, um, retaining a high resolution, large format film image. Um, but the smaller film gauge on VistaVision meant the depth of field would be deeper at an equivalent T-stop or F-stop to keep things simple. They were kind of performing a balancing act because ideally you'd want to shoot your miniatures on the equivalent scaled down sensor size that the model is at. Um, so if the model is one one hundredth scale, uh, you sort of want your miniature sensor to be one one hundredth of the size of the sensor on the regular camera you're using to shoot the movie. Um, but you can kind of cheat that using different, you know, apertures and lenses and things like that. Um, but Nolan opting to shoot entirely on film as well, uh, that would be virtually impossible. Um, 16 or 8 millimeter film simply doesn't have the resolving capabilities um, to be used for visual effects. They have been used for them, um, but any professional Hollywood movie is not going to want to unless they're specifically going for that look for some reason. Um, to further illustrate this point, see how if I add a blur effect at the top and bottom of this photo, suddenly everything looks like a miniature and not full size. And to tie this in with what I said about before about aspect ratio, this really doesn't work the same way if we change that effect from horizontal to vertical, or if we change the aspect ratio to a wider one. Now when it comes to depth of field, I'm not saying in every IMAX film is shot wide open with very blurred backgrounds, but you do notice even in IMAX documentaries when viewed in their full open mat 1.43 to 1 aspect ratio, that due to the filmmakers composing in this taller aspect ratio, you simply wind up seeing more of the foreground than you normally would, thus showing off more depth of field, thus making the image feel larger. Again, look at how the houses in this shot kind of look like miniatures. It's also why a LIMAX theater, which isn't actually in the 143 to 1 aspect ratio, it's the smaller IMAX theater, doesn't really feel like IMAX all that much. Um, so you may be wondering why I haven't really talked about resolution here. And that's because while IMAX does have an impressively large revolution, resolution for film, it's normally scanned at about 11K, due to the natural softness of film, the actual spatial fidelity or resolute clarity of the image is only about 6K. That said, there are lots of cameras that shoot 5 or 4 or 6K, which don't really look much like IMAX because they don't involve the other aspects I discussed earlier. Even a Blackmagic Ursa 12K, despite its massive resolution, won't automatically look like IMAX unless you take into account those other factors because it's only got a Super 35 sensor. So the X-H2S has that 6.2K sensor uh, to match IMAX film's resolution. It has a very similar 1.50 native aspect ratio 
on its sensor to roughly match the 1.43 to 1 IMAX ratio. All it's really missing is the large format sensor. And luckily there is a workaround for that. Uh, as mentioned earlier, speed boosters are in simple terms basically like a magnifying glass for camera sensors. Again, taking that wider beam of light from a large format lens and narrowing it onto the smaller sensor, or in other words, magnifying that sensor to look bigger to the lens in a weird way. Now, even full frame or VistaVision is still much smaller than IMAX film. So the other thing I did is use a lens that's already quite fast. Um, this Rokinon 24 millimeter has a max aperture out of the box of T1.5. And because the speed booster is focusing a larger area of light onto a smaller sensor, that focusing of the light narrows the beam um, and adds about one stop of light to the lens. Uh, again, like how the narrower Fresnel beam um, gets uh, brighter when you narrow the beam on a light. Um, so that makes this T1.5 into almost a T1. For comparison, the lenses that Kubrick used to shoot Barry Lyndon in pure candlelight, which is uh, all in the media division mentioned, uh, video mentioned earlier, um, they were T0.7. So T1 is actually quite fast when it comes to cinema lenses. Um, and when you consider that most of the Hasselblad lenses used to shoot IMAX film only really go down to about T2, the Rokinon here is a full two stops faster than that, meaning the depth of field is going to essentially balance out when you factor in the smaller sensor on the uh, XH2S or film plane sizes. I also adjusted my custom film emulation process, film uh, Pastromo M65, which you can download for free in the description. Um, to match the finer grain look of IMAX film. The answer works great for this because it really allows you to fine tune the procedurally generated grain within the plugin. Um, this isn't a sponsored video, but there is a 10% off discount link in the description for Dehancer. Um, it's what I and many cinematographers use for film emulated grain um, and is well worth the price. A quick side note about trying to emulate or achieve an IMAX film look is also to remember that an IMAX camera is really, really massive. Um, you're going to want to avoid shakiness and quick, lightweight camera movements um, that often come with shooting on something like a smaller mirrorless camera. Uh, if you can, add as much weight to the camera as possible, um, especially if, like me, you're shooting on, again, a smaller mirrorless camera. Um, so I've got this uh, XHS2, and I actually do have the uh, monitor that's on top of my camera. I usually have that on there to add weight. Um, and I actually tried at one point rigging my XH2S onto the front of my Ursa G2, which I'm shooting to film this now, using the rails um, for some of these shots, uh, just to get the camera to be as insanely heavy as a real IMAX camera is, which was kind of a fun experiment. So to conclude, ultimately the way you choose to shoot your films should be motivated by subject matter, much more than the pursuit of a particular technical look. Um, this was a very fun experiment to play around with, and I am really happy uh, with how the footage looks. Um, but of course, I'm not gonna be using the IMAX look for everything that I shoot. Um, it's a great tool to have at my disposal though, and I'm using this exact process for some scenes in my second feature film that I'd like to have a, a grander feel. Um, but again, as cool as looking, uh, as cool looking as IMAX is, um, there are, in my opinion, instances where the look would clash with the storytelling. Um, it goes without saying, but the tools should always serve the thesis of the story. So that's the end of the video. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Um, maybe you disagree with something I've said, or maybe you tried it out yourself in a different way, whatever it is. Um, I love discussing this stuff. So please don't hesitate to comment. Thanks for watching.